Now let us move to our worship service. And in worship we will sing, uh, remain seated and sing The Blood Will Never Lose Its Power by Andre Crouch. Such a wonderful song. If you haven't ever sung it, look it up. Simple and powerful. Then the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. I don't know why my phone did that. I'm sorry. Just like regular church. In the call to worship from Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Now I would remind you in that psalm when it says, who will ascend to the hill of the Lord, who can come to worship in the temple, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, means he has not given his hands to doing evil and violent works. A man who is at peace with his fellow man and is pure in his heart toward God. That's what clean hands is referring to. Then we will stand and sing Holy, 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 one of the great Trinitarian hymns. There are not a lot of hymns that celebrate the Trinity, but Holy, Holy, Holy is a classic. And it's taken from Isaiah 6, where the angels and the seraphim and all of, all of the creatures in heaven are singing Holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty. Heaven and earth is filled with His glory. So that's a great biblical hymn as well. And now we'll have the invocation in the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, grant us clean hands and a pure heart that we may approach you with wisdom, with a hunger and a thirst after righteousness, with a willingness to always pardon our neighbor, with a willingness to serve you even when it's hard. Hear our prayer and help us to worship, to know your presence, to bask in your grace, for we bring nothing to the table. We come only as beggars. And we pray in the name of Jesus who taught us when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In response to God's grace, we will stand and sing the glory of Patri. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Then we will sing, Tell Me the Old, Old Story. I have found as a Christian of 50 years, I never get tired of the gospel. Every day I read the wonderful message that in Christ alone there is pardon, and sin, pardon from sin. That in Christ I can draw near and find grace to help in time of need. It never gets old to me. Tell me the old, old story. Don't, don't fancy it up. Don't monkey it up. Don't dumb it down. Tell me the story of Jesus. And then in response to that grace, we will present our tithes and our offerings. The work of our hands is all we have to offer to God. The money that we have exchanged for the work of our hands is very important. So I hope you'll always remember not to worship empty-handed. Be a giver not just a taker. The amount doesn't matter. The importance you set on it is what matters. What does it mean to you? If it means nothing, then it means nothing to God, and certainly He doesn't need it. But we need to learn to be unselfish and to acknowledge in thanksgiving that we live and breathe and move in the grace and mercy of God who gives us the power to work, to think, and to speak and to take care of ourselves in this world. 
So we give in that spirit. Then we will stand and sing the doxology as well. And then we'll have two scripture readings from 1 Corinthians 9, 16 to 23, and Mark 1, 35 to 45. We read them responsively in church because the church, the people who come to worship, are not spectators. They are the worshipers. Together we are worshiping. They don't come to watch me worship or to watch a band sing or to watch a choir sing. They come to do it themselves, and we simply lead in that regard. Today's message is drawn from Mark 1, 35 to 45, and it focuses on an amazing event when Jesus heals a leper, which he had done, he will do several times in during his ministry. But remarkably, I want us to look at what the leper did and what Jesus did also, and what Jesus did not do. So, to keep from being too confusing now, let us look at Mark chapter 1, 35 to 45. The same story can be found in Matthew 8. Matthew 8 says that a large crowd was following Jesus when a leper came up and knelt before him. Now, when a large, large crowd was around Jesus, usually people couldn't get close, but you can imagine when this leper walks up, the crowd spreads and gives him plenty of room. And he falls at the feet of Jesus. It was unlawful for a leper to do this. And the crowd usually would stone the infected man who had this incurable disease. By law, leprosy could not a leper could not come close to uninfected people. So notice first then what the leper did. He acted on his behalf that Jesus could heal him. He acted on that belief that Jesus could heal him. If you are willing, you can make me clean, he said to Jesus. No one who came to Jesus in that belief was ever turned away. That's very important to remember. I don't know who all watches this broadcast during the week or on Sundays, from the numbers that they report to us, there are several hundred people every week. Each one of you should know that no one who ever came to Jesus with that request, if you are willing, you can make me clean, was turned away. Jesus came to save us, not to chide us or to punish us. He came to redeem all those who come to him in sincerity and in truth. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John give proof that Jesus healed all who came to him in the belief that Jesus would heal them if he were willing. You'll knock yourself out trying to find a single incident of Jesus saying no to anyone who asked him for his help. Help me, Jesus. I am lost and incapable to save myself is a prayer always answered. If you've never said that prayer, I hope you will. Help me, Jesus. I am lost and incapable to save myself. I've said that many times during life. But there are many kinds of being lost, not just lost from, the, from uh, irreconciled to God, not being reconciled to Him, but you can be lost in a lot of ways, not knowing what will happen. But if you pray that prayer consistently, you will see results. You will hear from God. Help me, Jesus. I am lost and incapable to save myself. This leper and all those Jesus healed did not know a lot of things about Jesus. He did not know about Jesus' virgin birth. He did not know that angels appeared to the shepherds keeping watch over their flocks by night. He didn't know about the wise men from the east following the miraculous star to the manger in Bethlehem. He didn't even know that Jesus was God in the beginning and that Jesus is the Word of God, as John says. His theological knowledge was terribly lacking. But one thing he knew for certain, if you are willing, you can make me clean. You don't have to be a person who's memorized every passage of Scripture, a person who does great things for God, a person of great faith and great uh, prophecy or anything else that's wonderful in this, this world. Some people are those things, but you don't have to be. All you have to know is 
If you are willing, you, you can make me clean. That is the cry of true faith, saving faith that is rewarded by God. If you are willing, make me clean. Do you believe that about Jesus? Have you said that to Jesus? He is willing. At the time that this man made this plea, Jesus had not yet gone to the cross. So there were many things about him that no one knew. We're on this side of the cross. We know he is willing. We know he will make us clean, which means he will remove every consequence of sin. That's really what being clean means. Removing every consequence of sin from our lives. What are those consequences that Jesus removes? First of all, he removes ignorance of God. The consequence of sin is we don't know God. We have blinded our hearts. We don't see him around us. We can't read nature like we could, well, Adam could in the garden before he sinned. So Jesus came to reveal to us who God is, what God has done for us, and how to be reconciled to God. The consequence of sin is ignorance of God, and Jesus removes that ignorance. When we come to him, and depend on his love and mercy for sinners. There's a second consequence to sin also that Jesus removes. The physical miseries and their ultimate conclusion in death. Our blessed Savior Jesus Christ has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. We still fear <coughs> because we are weak and timid creatures. But the scripture says, there's no more dying, we will not really die. There's no more sorrows, no crying, that's coming. Our Savior promises it. Neither will there be any more pain. At the moment, those are some holdovers, they're leftovers from the removal of sin from us, the consequences of sin. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 says that since the children were flesh and blood, he too took on himself human nature, that by dying in our nature, he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were in fear of dying. The consequences of the fear of dying, of the miseries of, the physical, of this physical life, are removed in Christ. And the closer we get to him, the easier it is to face these things because they have been whipped. They cannot, there's still an enemy among us, but they cannot overcome us. Jesus said, whoever lives and believes in me will never die, which is the third uh, consequence that he takes from us. He takes away eternal wrath. He takes away the ignorance of God, he takes away the physical miseries and the ultimate conclusion in death. And he takes away his eternal wrath. Ephesians 2, 3 says, We are all by nature objects of wrath. But God, in his great mercy, sent Christ to die in our place. And whoever puts his trust in him will never be put to shame. This is the holy gospel of our Lord. So, Jesus removes every consequence of sin. Those are three categories. The ignorance of God. Now we know who God is and what he's done for us. The physical miseries and their ultimate conclusion in death. They will not claim us. They will not hold us. And his eternal wrath, which he has turned into himself, bore on the cross and rose again from the dead. So, this leper died excuse me, this leper acted on his belief that Jesus could heal him. If you are willing, you can make me clean. You need to say the same prayer with the understanding that God is absolutely willing. That's why he sent Christ into the world. And whoever asks him to bless him, to come into him, to possess him, Christ will do it. The leper did. Second, notice what Jesus did not do. He did not rebuke him or send him away. To Jesus, no one 
is incurable. He had compassion on him. This leper would ordinarily be driven away by stoning, maybe even killed for the threat he posed to the entire community. So that's what Jesus did not do. But now notice what Jesus did. He said, I will be clean. And then Jesus touched him. Touching a leper would immediately defile the person who touched him and put that person in quarantine. Moses' law prescribed that no one but a priest could touch the leper. Why would Jesus touch him when he could just as easily spoken the word of healing? He did that with a centurion's servant when the centurion came and said, Lord, my servant is sick, but if you'll speak the word, he'll be healed. Jesus said, well, I will come. And he said, you don't need to come. Just say the word and he will be healed. And Jesus did say the word. He never saw the man's servant. He never saw the man he was healing. But it must have been important for the crowd to witness the touch of Jesus, who had power and authority even greater than the priest. And it also must have been important for the leper to feel the touch of Jesus. It was a part of the greater compassion of Jesus to touch the untouchables, to touch those whom no one else wanted to touch. Don't miss the fact that it was by God's love to the world that Jesus had a hand with which to touch someone. Had he not come in the flesh, he would not have that hand. For this purpose, he came into the world to give up his humanity and sacrifice for the sins of the world. And touching that leper was the touch of God. Then, after Jesus healed him, he sent the man to show himself to the priest according to Leviticus 14. The stunned and amazed priest would follow the Mosaic laws and return the healthy man to his family and community with an official certificate of health, compliments of Jesus of Nazareth. And with the last instruction, Jesus told the man to do something that proved to be too much for the man. He told him with a strong warning, don't tell anyone about this. How could you not? This was the only thing Jesus asked of the man, but it was something the man could not do. He couldn't contain himself and began to talk freely, spreading the news. And as a result, Jesus could not enter a town without being mobbed by a crowd, says the word. But he had to stay outside, and this is the phrase that Mark gives us, in lonely places. Jesus had to go into lonely places. That is an interesting twist. A bit of irony. Before the healing, the leper lived outside the town in lonely places. A man who was unwanted by other men. Now, as a result of his mercy, Jesus is the most wanted man and forced to stay outside in lonely places. Why would Jesus withdraw to lonely places? He needed solitude. He needed to rest and to refresh himself physically and spiritually. Jesus, in his humanity, needed to withdraw from the needy crowd. Today our Lord has no need to seek out lonely places, praise God. He is sitting at the right hand of God, interceding on behalf of all who call upon him for healing from the consequences of sin. We know that surrounding heaven now there are angels and the church triumphant, and cherubim and seraphim, worshiping night and day, mighty singing of new songs continually. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. So he's not in a lonely place. His glory has been restored. He waits for the command of the Father when he will stand up and return to redeem his people and finish his kingdom. And then every eye will see him and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So now let you and me determine that we believe that Jesus heals us too. Faith is the one gift that makes all other gifts possible. 
Without faith, it's impossible to please God. You must believe that in calling upon him, he will save you. We don't have to say, if you will, you can take away all the consequences of sin. He will. He did. He does. He has already done so. And now he tells you to believe that he died and rose again for you and that all the promises of eternal life are yours for trusting in him. Remember the phrase, whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. This our Savior is doing for you right now at the right hand of the Father. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray for courage in this life to face the remnants of sin that remain. We pray for holiness, that we will be so separated unto you in our hearts that the world cannot steal our joy nor take it away. We pray, Lord Jesus, to you, because you will make us clean. Hear our cry now. We pray only in your name and in your merit. Amen. So now we sing Onward Christian Soldiers Marching as to War with the cross of Jesus going on before. A great old hymn which reminds us we need to share the gospel. We're headed for a destination, and that is the church triumphant. So let's do what we can in the meantime to serve our loving Christ. And then the closing responsive litany taken from Romans 8, 31 to 34. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Receive now the benediction. Now may the grace, mercy, and peace from Almighty God, Father, Son, and Spirit, who raised from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that we might have life, be with all of you who seek for him and love him in, in sincerity. For Jesus' sake, amen. <laughs>